This podcast is brought to you by UPS. Now one of the world's largest package delivery companies, UPS started out as a small business too. So they have the expertise and experience to make international shipping easy for your business. Find out more at www.ups.com forward slash SMB. Hello and welcome to Small Business Snippets, the podcast from smallbusiness.co.uk. I'm your host, Anna Jordan. Today we have Paul Lindley, author, campaigner and founder of Ella's Kitchen. He founded the company in 2006 after being dissatisfied with the lack of healthy, tasty and convenient food choices for children. He sold the company in 2013 to Hain Celestial and stepped away completely in 2018 to focus on his social campaigning. In that very year, he was appointed chairman of the London Child Obesity Task Force by none other than London Mayor Sadiq Khan. These days, Paul is chairman of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights UK, as well as a trustee at Sesame Workshop created by Sesame Street. He also sits on the board of social enterprise Toastale. Today, we'll be discussing what it takes to run an ethical business, as well as the unexpected business skills that you might have had as a toddler. You'll notice that this intro is slightly different to the other podcasts, and that's because I'm presenting it to camera. Yes, this is the first video version of the podcast that we're doing. So hello if you're watching and if you're listening and want to check it out, you can head over to our YouTube channel, which I've linked in the description of wherever you're listening. Now, let's get on with the interview. Hi, Paul. Hi, Anna. How are you? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? Good. I'm feeling, I'm feeling quite positive actually. I had my COVID first COVID jab this morning. Oh, did so you? I'm sore, but I'm. It's it's an excuse to think positively about the future. So. Yeah. And it's yeah. incredible what they've done yeah. over the last, you know, six months as a yeah. business, or well, like last year, but as a business to take all that innovation through to get 25 million people within what 12 weeks. Uh, I know. I know. It's been an awful year um, mm. in so many ways, but you know we've got to look forward. We've got to pick on the things we've learned. We've got to celebrate some of the pivoting that businesses have done, the innovation that's come around, the resilience, the community that we've built over this time, and sort of build back better. But never yeah, forget what, what suffering we've had this last year. Absolutely. Okay, so let's just jump straight in. In your book, uh, Little Wins, uh, you talk about the the business skills that we have as a toddler that we unlearn so what kind of business skills are you referring to and what kind of practical exercises can business owners do to relearn these skills okay thank you for uh carrying in straight away with little wins because it's it's such a passion of mine i mean the the book came out of my experience of 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 building ella's kitchen Uh, and really the experience of you know inside of me as this great head 50 something year old, you know, there's a little boy. And I think that was the key within Ella's Kitchen that we had this mm-hmm. childlike mindset of that we could do stuff, we could have an imagination and a free thinking that would make, make, make business work when everyone was saying, it's, you know, the, the odds are really stacked against you. So I took that and I took the heart of our hero, our core consumer, um, and, and sort of thought through the skills that toddlers have and how we use them in our company. Mm -hmm. And then sort of took a step back and and thought, well, everyone was a toddler and everyone can unlock their personal potential as an adult or a business owner, Mm -hmm. not by learning new skills, but by relearning and rediscovering those old old ones of imagination and free thinking and self-confidence and um, a whole nine of them that that I put in in my book. Mm -hmm. So so sort of simplify this complicated life that we've got to allow us to make decisions in business or in our personal lives, like toddlers do with much less information and move forward with sort of positivity and can do a can do mindset. So really, it's it's about that idea that you can become the best person of the person that you once were, the best version of a person that you once were by having this toddler mindset. And you can bring that to your personal life, you can bring that to, to, to business. So the sort of things that I talk about are the, the fact that toddlers have such confidence, such creativity, they, ha- they dive right into things, they never give up, they get noticed, they're honest with each other, they show their feelings, they have fun, they involve others, all sorts of things. That, to be honest, by the time we're all like four or five years old, we must think, life's great. I'm only four or five and I've learned all these skills. 
I'm going to live to 85. And what more is there to come? And the truth is that whether us, how our society works, whether that's parenting or education or the corporate system, narrows our, our vision and, our, and, and sort of asks us to conform. And, you know, if you're a small business owner, if you're an entrepreneur, you want you and your team not to conform. You want you and your team to imagine things that could be possible and to go and do them, to have the wherewithal to, do, to, to go and do them. And it's really, it's all about mindset uh, of the corporation, the culture, the mindset of the culture of, of the business. And you, you as the business owner, or you as the, the senior person in that accountancy firm, you've got the opportunity to set that. And I think it's, it's by, by setting up systems and processes and recruiting the right people that have the mindset so that you can be brave and curious. Both of those things are, are, are necessary because what is true for any business or any of us in this world right now is if we do nothing, we keep the status quo, we'll move backwards because the world is changing at such a rapid pace. We have to innovate. We have to try things that may or may not work. And we've got to build the confidence and um, the, the bravery and the curiosity to, to, to experiment and find that way through because that gives us the edge. And that's, that's really cultural, I think. And you, know, you, can set, you can set your corporate reward system to be, oh, we'll set bonuses wholly on financial performance, wholly on growing 5% from last year, and we all know we can get that. Well, maybe we should have set a five-year bonus that doesn't expect to grow in any given year because we're trying things that are going to really deliver in three or four years' time. And, and we're happy to make mistakes and get it wrong because as long as we can iterate and we can learn, we can adapt, and we can build something from those trials and errors, then we will have a better business over a five year period. So how, you know, and I would advocate that we certainly didn't tell us kitchen and businesses I'm involved with now don't, is, is build a, a bonus scheme based on one year wholly on financial performance. Obviously you need a business, you need a successful sustainable business that makes profits and that is, is, should be tied to bonuses, but the, living the values of the reason why your company exists, I think should be embedded within the way people are remunerated and motivated and, and, and rewarded for uh, contributing to their company. So setting your values, for example, at Ellis Kitchen, we had five. One of them was to be childlike. So that might be okay for, you know, a consumer brand that's got a kind of fun personality for the marketing people to deliver. But if you're the payroll person or the accounts receivable person, how do you interpret being childlike in, into your work? You know, and one of them one year brought, uh, renamed, renamed the remittance advisors to be from my piggy bank to yours. That was the, how they, 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 they reworded it. That was the small thing that they did, but it brought a smile to the person who's in the business that, that they were dealing with that, yeah. that the payment had to come from. And that person may have been a parent or may not, may have talked to somebody that was a parent or may not. And it was just a way that, just in a tiny little language change, we could get people talking about our business. And that was a, a real thinking like a child aspect and that person got that part of their bonus based on that. So uh, that, that's one, one thing is really around, you know, the culture and the systems that you set up. But ultimately you want to employ people with an open mindset that do believe in the reason you set up the business and believe that you can get there because if you're a small business, it's probably against the odds that you will get there unless you stack yourself with people who believe it, will go out of their way to do it because they're mm -hmm. motivated you inspire them, they know what the mission of the business is, you know what the business plan, what it takes to get there, and everyone works on that together to deliver. And that's where this idea of thinking like a toddler um, can really be in fact impactful. And now a word from our sponsor. Today's opportunities for your business are borderless. As a global shipping provider, UPS is here to help your business capitalize on growing local and international markets and reach new customers across its global network. Find out more at www.ups.com forward slash SMB. Absolutely. Right. So I'm going to go from starting a business right through to exit. I mean, one of the key decisions if you're looking to exit is who you're going to pass your business on to and, and are, are they going to carry on as you would see fit. Um, so I guess with Ella's Kitchen, because your, uh, your vision and your values are so deeply ingrained in the brand, uh, how did you go about making the decision of finding the right successor for the business? 
Well, when you sell your business, it's hugely emotional and it's very personal. So my experience may be very different to others. And, and some people want to sell their business, walk away, don't really care what happens. They want the money in the bank and they created something from nothing. And that was their job. I named my business after my daughter. I have, as you said, very personally put set the vision and the values of how the, the first uh, number of years went for Ella's. And it, it does, does matter to me still what becomes of Ella's and, and, and that it, it maintains those, those values. So there's, there's two things I think in that. One, one is who do you sell to? And the other is who succeeds you as the, as the chief executive? So who do you sell to? I sort of thought as a horse race in a way, and I, 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 there were three jumps to get over, and each of them was associated with the word value. The first jump to get over, and if a potential acquirer couldn't get over that, we wouldn't talk to them, was values. Do they see the same world in the same way as we see it? Do they, will they support and protect the way we've seen the world and the way our business has been successful because we've seen the world that way? Will they tinker with it? And if they tinker with it, we'll tell them now, it will fail. And so, you know, don't, don't let's stop the conversation. But if they do see the world in the same way, if they believe the why of why we set Ella's up and why it's successful, and they give us the confidence that they won't tinker with that, then we're over that first hump. Run to the second fence, that's value. We've all worked really hard to create something of value. You need to pay us the price that that, that value um, uh, d should deliver. And so there's obviously an overlap between the two. If, the, if there's an overlap, great, we can continue the race. If there isn't an overlap, we need to walk away because that, that's just not recognized. So then we get over that second uh, hurdle. And then the final fence is really around um, added value in my view. And it's sort of what added value are they going to do to this business to make it better than we could do without them? Maybe they'll open up more markets. Maybe they'll uh, have their own factory that we can be more efficient and, uh, and better supply chains. Um, lots of reasons why. So, so what do they add? And if we get all over them, then we can start to get into the, 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 uh, the deal and, and, and the legals. Um, so so we, we were very careful to go through that. We sold um, and then it was okay. I stayed on board for another year. I ran their business um, and, and others' kitchens for $300 million business for, for a year, delivered what we promised um, and then wanted to stand back. Um, and, and then it was, well, who is going to, to, to deliver um, and keep the, the heartbeat of this company going? I'm a big believer in, in promoting and rewarding from within a company with, with, with sort of developing um, talent uh, and making people feel as though they can get to the top. Um, and we have some excellent, uh, excellent uh, leaders within the business. The, the guy that, uh, that, that took over had been in the business for three or four years, uh, was the sales director. Uh, seven years later, is still the CEO, a guy called Mark Culligan, and he is just awesome. Um, he is the, you know, sometimes I joke that perhaps he's the best leader that Ellis has had when he had to, um, and one of them was me. But um, he has taken that business, keeping its heart, keeping its soul, keeping that mission and that vision as a feeling rather than something in the head, and delivered it with his own handprint, with a team that has gone on and expanded, you know, the value, the, the, the sort of impacts that, that the business has, both in terms of shareholder return, but also stakeholder return and delivering the mission to help children live better lives. Um, and I think, you know, you've got to do your homework for who that person is, if you care what happens next. I think it's absolutely based on, on values and, and, and how people see the world. And I looked, we looked for um, five leadership skills, really. And I always do this with uh, any sort of recruitment, no matter what the level, really. If they, if they aspire to be a leader, um, if, they, if, if we want them to be able to inspire their team going forward. And those are about emotional maturity because it is going to be a roller coaster ride and you've got to take the rough with the smooth and you've got to be mature about, about that. It's about a drive for improvement all the time, never being satisfied that where you are is where you're going to get to, driving your processes, your systems, your products, culture, everything forward all the time, constantly. It's about effective communication. So many, so many mistakes in business happen because we don't hear each other properly or we don't take the time to uh, talk to each other or listen to each other. And that effective, constant communication is absolutely vital. And then the final thing is about an ability to see the wider context of, of where our business sits in the industry, where the industry sits in society and what we can control and what we can't. And the fact, that kind of leads to the fact that 
you know, you don't have to actually win every battle. You, you, you kind of want to win the war in the end if you and achieve your vision. But, you know, you can collaborate with your competitors in certain areas. You can do things together that will improve not only both of your businesses, but also the, the, the consumer or the client's um, uh, life at, at the end of it by, 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 by working together sometimes or working with your suppliers or your uh, customers. So those, those sort of five things, Mark excels at all of those. And, um, you know, it, and I, I would say, you know, the, the learning that I'd seen from others and which I was determined not to do was, you know, my time was over. If I was going to stand back, I'm standing back. Mm -hmm. I'm there at his ear if he wants advice. And, you know, he's, he's counseled advice in the past and that his team does. But, you know, don't be a backseat driver. Let them make the mistakes or the failures that they need to make to understand how, how they can get uh, to, to success. Uh, but be, 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 be a counsel. And I think, you know, the two most proud things I have about Ellis Kitchen's experience happened after I ceased to be CEO. The first one is that it, it became a B corporation. And Mark and I worked with the, with the shareholder and, and with the team to make sure that it qualified by that. But I was incredibly proud that Ellis Kitchen was one of the first B corporations in this um, country. And I think the B corporation movement is... Um, an incredible movement to nudge forward the way we do business to a much better place. And the second thing is, I think for the last five years, Ellis Kitchen has been voted one of the UK's best companies to work for. And that's Mark inspiring his team to really enjoy working there, really feel as though they're achieving something, being rewarded however which way that is for, 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 for that contribution. So we've talked a lot about um inside the organization and what's effective. Um, and of course you're an advocate of B Corp and a lot of small businesses today are wanting to show customers their ethics and their ethical credentials. Um, how would you suggest uh, small businesses go about uh, basically proving how ethical they are? Yeah, so what B Corporations are, they're businesses that meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance. So they set themselves up for public transparency and legal accountability to deliver on more than a purpose of making money. And they hold themselves accountable for that. So um, what the, the process you have to do is you have to do this test, this, this um, survey um, where uh, it's really hard to pass, but um, you only need 40% to pass, but it's hard to get to that 40%, which looks at, at all aspects of your business, the governance, the uh, supply chains, the people, uh, the finance, loads of things. And so you, you have to do things to make sure that you're a sustainable, structurally um, sustainable business. Then once you pass that, you've got to go into your constitution of your company and change it effectively to say, we're not just about shareholder return, maximizing that, we're about stakeholder return and optimizing that. We care about the environment and the communities that we draw our teams from and we sell to. Um, and, and each of those things are as important as the profit that we make. Because, you know, think about it, the business that we operate is in the ecosystem of all sorts of other things that are happening in the world. And you want a healthy interdependence between communities, the planet, and business and profit that, that works together. So I can give you statistics to show that B corporations perform uh, better financially over the long term than um, non-B corporations. I can show you that the cost space is more efficient because people stay longer because they see and believe and your mission is verified and you know where you're going. Um, what it brings, it validates your reason, your why, your mission. Mm -hmm. It tells your staff and your potential staff that you are committed to, to it and um, Ellis Kitchen and some of the new businesses I'm involved with, we've had staff applying, team people applying to the roles because it's a B corporation. Mm -hmm. It protects you versus your shareholders, if you like, in that you, know, you can, I don't know, create more environmentally friendly packaging, but it costs a penny more and you can't be fired for, by that because the environmental impact is as important to the profitability of the company. Yeah. Um, and you create, you, you join this network of wonderful business leaders that are really trying to use business as a force for good. 
Um, so I'm a huge advocate of it. It puts pressure on yourselves to live, to walk the walk of what you're talking, um, but it ingrains and it helps you think through the social, the environmental and the governance aspects to make your business not only the best in the world, but the best for the world as well. And I hope it's the future of business. And by looking at the first five years of B Corporation in this country, which we've just passed our, our fifth birthday, um, it's growing, growing like nowhere else in the world. And those businesses are performing better with more lo loyal and uh, engaged staff. That's interesting because I would have thought, yeah, it's because consumers are becoming more savvy that it would be more of a draw for them. But I never thought of that, that it would attract employ employees who would be looking for the B Corp certificate as well or would be attracted by that B Corp certificate. If I could just take that back to people again, consumers and employees are people. They're That's going true. about their yeah. lives wanting to find things that live what ethics and values they have in their head. If that's mm -hmm. buying something because it's got a little knitted bobble on the top of the smoothie that, it, that it's going to give money towards grannies versus one that isn't, yeah. maybe they'll buy that one. If the employee wants to work for somebody that isn't just about making money for the shareholders, but is also helping society where we've got a problem with loneliness with older people, that person's happy. So I don't think business is really about economics, although mm -hmm. it has to make money. It's about psychology. It's about understanding why somebody is going to change their behavior because you exist and that behavior is going to improve their lives. You're going to be able to make some sustainable returns out of it. And we all live, we're going to live in a better world because of what you've done. And you'll feel really good when you create a business that does that. Every one of your team will and the consumer will as well because we're all just people. Well, I can't follow that. So I'll wrap up there. But thank you ever so much for coming on the podcast, Paul. It's been great. Absolutely welcome, Anna. Delighted to share some things that I hope can help others. You can find out more about Paul and his book Little Wins, The Huge Power of Thinking Like a Toddler at paullinley.uk. You can also check out smallbusiness.co.uk for more articles on exit strategies and making your business greener. Remember to like us on Facebook at Small Business Experts, follow us on Twitter at Small Business UK, all lowercase, and subscribe to our YouTube channel linked in the description. Until next time, thank you for listening.